So uh, I hope everybody is uh, itching to get outside. Uh, I know some of you have been outside. I've been outside. Um, and Brandy and I were just talking. And uh, this week, uh, it's been a real mixed bag of weather. And I managed to get my lawn done on Monday night. And every single night uh, thereafter, um, we've had uh, sleet, snow, even some very light hail, depending on where you are in Calgary. But on my lawn, every single night, it's the moment I get home, it's a gorgeous day I'm in my office. I get home, it gets cloudy, it gets cold, the snow comes down, and I got to walk the dog in it. Thanks, Mother Nature. And I'm on my patio. Yeah, love you. Oh, yeah. And meanwhile, Brandy in the South, we were talking about it. I'm like, yeah, every night this week, she's like, we got nothing. I'm like, <laughs> just turn that screw. So, um, well, let's talk about lawns. Um, you know, this is a time of year when, when people are outside, and the first job we often see people doing uh, is working on their lawns. Um, and I get it. Uh, it's a good exercise. Uh, it's good to get out. It cleans it up. Um, it's it's relatively simple to do. It's a good introduction to the season. Um, but what is a lawn? Let's start there. So when, when I talk to somebody about lawn, uh, most people immediately think of grass, uh, sod, turf. Um, and, and that is where our brains should go. Um, even with all the lawn alternatives, and I've got some on display here, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, grass is still uh, by far the most popular lawn item. Uh, and a lawn is just an area of durable plants packed tight close together uh, in a specific boundary. So um, if you think of a soccer field, if you think of a baseball diamond, uh, you think of your lawn, it might have a it might have a circular shape, it might be a perfect square, whatever it might be. But there is a defound uh, a defined boundary, uh, be it your flower beds, your veggie beds, uh, the fence, the back alley, whatever it might be, the driveway, uh, it establishes the boundary of the lawn. And uh, oftentimes lawns uh, they're designed to not get tall. We don't want them big. We don't want tall forester grass as a lawn, for example. Uh, we want ones that we can cut, uh, relatively easy maintenance, durable. They can take traffic um, for, for a multiple of purposes. And we do have options. So this year, we're going to be bringing one in. I don't have it now. It's still too early. It's called sedum turf. Uh, people use creeping thyme. We've got clover. A uh, really, really popular alternative. And these are uh, the considered alternatives. And the reason that they are used, uh, the creeping thyme and the clover, even the sedum, is that they can take foot traffic. If I walk through your perennial bed, you're probably going to hit me with a shovel and you'd probably be right. Um, though I don't condone violence, but it would be violence against plants if I'm walking through your perennial bed. All kinds of, we that's got layers to it. Um, <laughs> But our lawn and our lawn alternatives are designed to handle foot traffic. Um, now, depending on what we have, we have kids, dogs, uh, a, a playing area. We may need uh, something more uh, suitable for heavier traffic. If we're growing it purely as an aesthetic, uh, we want that green lawn, almost like the frame on the Mona Lisa, uh, to highlight our perennials and our trees and whatnot. Uh, we may require uh, something that can handle less maintenance. But however we look at it, that's what a uh, lawn is in a nutshell. And just so you know, uh, because we can digress, uh, which we've already done twice so far, my notes here are just to keep me on track. I literally just have the PowerPoint in front of me. Um, years ago, I think when we did the first one, uh, I, I just scrawled notes. I didn't keep up at all. It was rather chaotic. Uh, so this allows me to kind of stay on track with maybe what you're watching. So again, let's go back to grass lawns. And, and the primary focus today is going to be grass lawns. Like I said, that's still 90% of people um, in my neighborhood. Um, nobody has a lawn alternative. My lawn is probably the most alternative one. Uh, and that's because I allow uh, clover, dandelion, creeping bell, whatever, to go on in my lawn, it can take traffic, I can cut it, it meets all of the requirements of a lawn. It is an alternative, and I leave that for the pollinators, but the vast majority of people want to talk grass lawns. It is the most common type of lawn, relatively easy to maintain, um, 
it's going to catch most of the sun. It's going to catch most of the rain. It is the wide open expanse in front of our yards. Most people have more lawn than flower beds, raised planters, and whatnot. Um, you've got all kinds of options. You've got shade options. You've got sun options. You've got blends. You've got low maintenance, less water mixes. There's everything you need to have that grass lawn is available. It also offers aesthetic value. I know a lot of people, they love their pristine lawns. They love it to look like a golf course. And it is satisfying when you cut a lawn and you get those perfect lines and different patterns going on. Um, it does look really sharp. So, um, you know, that's another good option. And another thing about lawns um, is that they're really, really good uh, to prevent erosion. You have a hill. You're not sure what you can plant on it. A lawn is a good way to stabilize. Those roots form a carpet and they help lock that ground in. Um, and last but not least, is an affordable option. Um, you know, a bag of grass seed that might cover a thousand square feet, it can be like, you know, 15, 20 bucks, depending on what you're looking for. So it's still a very affordable option if you need to cover an area uh, and prevent that erosion and have something aesthetic. It is a good way to look at it. Okay. So let's talk about right now. That kind of defines lawns. And let's talk about right now when we look out the window. So uh, when I said I did my lawn, I did my front lawn, my back lawn, which gets significantly more shade. My house faces south, so the back gets a lot of shade on it. Uh, there's still snow and ice on it. So I didn't do the back lawn. I just did the front lawn. The front lawn is nice and dry. Um, and what I saw was, uh, my lawn was matted down. It was clumped together. Um, it's been through a hell of a window. Like I said, your lawn is exposed. It gets the sun. It gets the rain. Uh, but it also gets all of the hard conditions. Um, it, it's going to get ice buildup. Uh, depending on where you're situated, you might get water running onto it. Uh, there's all kinds of things that can go on with your lawn. So you're going to see your grass matted down. It's going to be brown. There's going to be debris. And by debris, I mean leaves, branches, actual garbage, uh, maybe some gifts from some uh, dogs. Uh, that's what you're going to find on the lawn. Uh, there can be winter mold, um, vole damage. That's a very common one we get. And you've got all of this that's built up over the winter. Uh, and the lawn doesn't look awesome when you first go out there it's kind of like oh that's not very nice um and then, oh and structural damage and what i mean i'm going to touch on that real quick see hence my notes <laughs> um structural damage what i mean by that happens on my grass uh every year um when i'm shoveling the street well i shovel i want as much sidewalk cleared as i can i have elderly neighbors i want it uh as nice as it can be so when i shovel i go and then i hit the grass now that grass is frozen, but it rips, it tears, because I'm using a uh, I'm using a, a metal bladed shovel so I can scrape. Um, it doesn't, I don't notice that damage, but I do notice in the spring, and I may have scalped it. If I'm pushing and I go like that, and I go from pavement to grass, I may rip grass off, I may damage it. When it falls um, and I go to rake it, there's an actual structural damage. It's not just winter kill. Uh, it's not just that it's gone brown because of lack of photosynthesis. It's actually damaged. So we're looking at all of this. Uh, where do we start? It can look overwhelming. Um, and the best place to start. So all I did when I did my front lawn is I started gently. Nothing likes to be woken up harsh and fast. And that includes your garden. And all I did is uh, I went out on Monday evening uh, and I took my rake and I used uh, my leaf rake. So a rake like this, plastic, very flexible. I can get strength on it. I can push down and get strength, but I didn't. I just very lightly flicked the grass. And all I was doing was getting the debris, uh, lifting the blades. So the blades are knotted. It's like brushing your hair. Um, I have long curly hair. Um, if I go outside on a windy day, uh, when I wake up in the morning, my hair is like, oh, it's nice at night. And then I wake up and it's like, hey, how are you? <laughs> uh, and I got to brush it out. Um, the grass is the same. It's matted. It's clumped. Here in Calgary, we get Chinooks. So it thaws. Animals run across it. So it's constantly getting mixed up. Maybe we didn't get a chance to cut it in the autumn. 
Uh, it was a bit longer and shaggier than we wanted. Again, like my hair. But either way, all I'm doing is I'm lifting it up. I'm getting the debris off it and I'm lifting it so that I can get airflow through it. I can get rid of, uh, allow some of that moisture to dry out, allow the warmth to get down to the roots. But the, the warmth, the warmth is going to stop on the thatch because I didn't dethatch my grass. I just cleaned it. And the reason I didn't dethatch is because I knew in the forecast uh, we were getting that snow. We were getting that moisture, that cold moisture. Um, we were getting a hard frost. I, I woke up one day and it was, it felt like autumn. Uh, you, you probably didn't get it. Where Brandy lives, it's subtropical. It was probably 18 degrees. But where I live, 20 minutes away, um, it was, you went outside and I stepped on the grass and it was that awesome crunchy white and you leave your footprint in it. Not awesome for the grass, but it makes me happy. So I do it. Um, so I left my thatch. I just cleaned off the debris and I left my winter piles. I'm not going to talk too much about this, but I am going to mention it. Uh, when I clean that debris and the leaves, and there is going to be some thatch that you lift, you can't help it. And that's fine. Um, I leave those piles on my lawn uh, and that's for all the beneficial bugs. Uh, my yard was full of ladybirds and I left those piles. Again, I knew frosts were coming. I knew that there was going to be uh, some not awesome weather and they can go hide in there. As it warms up, I will get rid of those piles and then I'll dethatch. So uh, when I go to dethatch, uh, I want to make sure it's warm and I want to make sure that the weather's going to be somewhat stable and I want to make sure that it's dry. Those are all very important, especially dry. Um, I've done it before. Uh, it's not awesome. Dethatching a wet lawn. And the, we're going to talk about dethatching a bit more. But this is the kind of rake I use for dethatching. It's a lot more sturdy. It's got the metal tines and it bites. So when you, you pull that grass, well, if your ground is soft, if your ground is damp and you do that, you run the risk of pulling out living grass at the same time. So you want to be very careful with that. And then after that, you're going to look at top dressing, reseeding, and fertilizing. So general, uh, gentle cleaning, already talked about that, okay? Just gentle. You don't want to kill yourself. You want to do some stretching. You don't want to pull a... Uh, so I used to landscape, and I still, in my brain, I landscaped for longer than I worked uh, in a garden center. So... Part of my brain is like still, oh, you're a landscaper. So I go outside to rake, no stretching, no, and I do it. And then the next day I go to pick up my coffee and I'm like, ah, oh, that hurts. Um, so, you know, bit of stretching, get out there and enjoy the sunshine and have a look at what's happening. One thing I love about it, even though I didn't uh, dethatch, I didn't water, I didn't fertilize. Uh, by the time I was finished, the part I'd started on already looked greener. It looked cleaner. And all I did is just get that debris garbage I got rid of right away. The uh, natural, the, the leaves, any plant material, the branches, those are my winter plants. And that's all I'm doing there. It's a gentle cleaning. Um, I'm just allowing my garden, uh, my lawn, uh, to wake up. So uh, I've mentioned it a few times now. Let's talk about thatch. And uh, thatch, um, unless you're constantly, constantly uh, raking and cleaning your lawn and bagging all of your grass clippings, thatch is going to happen. And it's not a bad thing. If you think of thatch as a natural mulch for your lawn, it's exactly what it is. It's exactly what it is. So thatch is a, uh, it's a natural buildup of um, all of, uh, I, I'm going to say organic because I mean, uh, you know, living materials, plant materials. Uh, not organic as in, you know, no chemicals or whatever else. It's just organic, like branches and leaves and grass clippings. And uh, we push the mower over it and we chop it up and we might bag it. And, and depending on the type of mower you use, uh, you might bag 90% uh, of your clippings. Maybe you're in uh, my, uh, my school of thought where you don't bag the clippings. You let them go back down onto the grass. Um, but that is going to start adding to the thatch. And what thatch does, and uh, I, I, on the PowerPoint, I included a picture, a cross section. Uh, if you want to have a quick look at that, um, I should just hold the picture up. <laughs> um, but that thatch, it's exactly like a mulch. 
So it's going to protect the roots. That's why I didn't dethatch. I knew we had a frost. I didn't want my roots exposed to that because that can damage the plant. The plant is just waking up. It's being dormant all winter. I just woke it up with a light raking. I pull that thatch off and the frost hits. The grass is like, I'm not enjoying my life. And it, it, it gets really, really cold. And you can damage those roots, especially if you furrowed the ground and you have exposed roots. So the thatch is going to protect against that. Thatch is also great. Like we said, your lawn is fully exposed. If we get too much water, too much rain, the thatch can pull some of that up. The water that does get through and gets down to the ground uh, that layer of thatch is going to prevent it from being evaporated immediately. So there is a ton of benefit uh, to having thatch on your lawn. Um, it's just a, it's a natural thing. You go to a golf course. If you took a rake to a golf course, we know how well they're maintained. Give it a, a, a few good pulls. You're going to lift some thatch up. It is a natural part of having a lawn, and you want it, but you don't want too much. Again, like mulch. If it is too deep, if you've never dethatched, it's going to start inhibiting all of those things that I said. So it's going to be too thick. So if you get a light rain, the thatch can absorb it all, and it's not getting to the roots of your grass. If your grass blade is that long and you have this much thatch, only this much can photosynthesize, the rest is blocked. So now your lawn isn't getting the energy it needs for its roots to establish growth and be healthier. Also, weed seeds can get into thatch. Weeds can germinate in asphalt, in concrete, in weed blankets, in mulch, in rock. You have thatch, which is organic material. You better believe that the weeds are going to get in. And once they're in, they're going to start establishing. So finding that right level of thatch is important. So when you have uh, your thatch, um, and we're looking at it, I always like to dethatch um, in the spring. I might do another raking, depending uh, on the type of lawn it is. Is it a lawn alternative? Probably not going to dethatch. Is it a pristine grass lawn, a Kentucky blue carpet? I will probably do a, a raking, maybe even two rakings mid-season. But I'm not going to do much after July, August because I want that thatch there for the autumn because we're going into winter and I want to protect it. That's enough talk about winter. <laughs> um, but in the spring, I want to get that thatch off. And the reason for that is I want my grass to breathe. I want the moisture to get in. When I seed, I want the seed to get uh, down onto the soil. I don't want the seed sitting on it. Plus, it's a good way to get a full inspection of the lawn. Uh, this has happened to me nearly every year that I rake. Uh, it's no big surprise. Lawn looks pretty decent. I go out, I rake, I de-thatch, and then I look and I've got bare patches because the thatch kind of looked green. There was some lawn sitting in it that I thought was alive, but it wasn't. And yet, once I cleaned up, I get to see what I'm looking at. There are other times when I've done it and the lawn has been ridiculously healthy, had a mild winter, whatever it may be. So the way to de-thatch, there's a couple of ways. There's power de-thatching. Uh, I don't do that um i've done it before physically it was easier i found it too hard on the lawn other people swear by it again i'm not here to tell you what you have to do uh i'll just tell you what i do and the process and at the end of the day uh the end result is the same we're getting thatch off the lawn so you want to take a rake harder rate you can as i said absolutely use a rake like this uh, you're just going to be putting more effort in. That's all, because it's, it is a softer rake, so you are going to have to put more pressure in. Too much pressure, you can also break your rake. I have been guilty of that. I like my dethatching rake. And you're going to really do those deep, hard pulls. You're going to hear tearing sounds. And all that is, if you're pulling out tons of healthy grass, stop. Okay, you're not ready to dethatch. The lawn is still too wet or it's not healthy enough, which means we need to look at something else. But if the green grass, the healthy lawn is staying there and you hear a rip and you look in the pile and the vast majority of your pile is that brown thatch, then you're dethatching correctly. And what you wanna do is you really wanna give it and go in a few different directions, okay? Um, you pull everything this way, well, eventually the thatch kind of rolls over on itself. 
go this way, go this way. And now you've pulled it up twice and you're really going to clean it up. This one, as opposed to the gentle one, is very much a uh, more vigorous workout. I'm lucky, yes, of doing it. I'm ambidextrous on raking. Uh, swap hands if you can. Wear gloves. Raking is going to give you uh, blisters like nothing else. And you really want to get in there deep. And you want it up. And the reason we want it up is, like I said, now we're going to talk about top dressing. And we're going to talk about uh, overseeding and fertilizing and watering. We don't want anything to inhibit uh, the, the, the things that we're putting down, those beneficial things to the lawn, we want them being on soil. We want them to get to the roots as quickly as possible, and that will inhibit that. So we know we have no more frost or snow or whatnot in the forecast. I can get that thatch off, and I can start opening my lawn properly. So then top dressing. Um, basically, that's one that a lot of people hear, and they... They're not sure what it means. Some people thinks, uh, think thinks some people think it means that you have to do uh, your whole lawn. Uh, you you got to put down two yards and you've got to blend it all in. Not at all. All we're doing with a top dress is we're adding a fine layer of a healthy material. It's again, I'm going to compare it to one that uh, more people can associate with. It is amending the soil for your lawn. So when we have a flower bed, uh, our, our raised planters, our veggie garden, veggie pod, whatever it might be, we amend that soil. So we put in our compost, our coir, our worm castings, whatever it might be, and we turn the soil. Now it's loose soil. There's no roots. We know where the roots are on our perennials, or it's totally open because we're about to plant our tomatoes. So we get in there with our cultivator and we go, da, 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 da. we get it all. We have to make that noise too. Da, 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 da. <laughs> uh, and we mix it all up. And we've added a ton of nutrition to that soil. We can't do, well, you can do that on the lawn, but please don't. Um, so how do we get that material onto the lawn? That's why we top dress. Mm -hmm. And people top dress depending on the lawn, depending on the conditions, depending on what they've done or what their parents taught them or what they were advised. Ton of different materials. Again, no right or wrong answers. Uh, people use a, a compost. I, I got a bag right here. So just... A compost like this, it's nice and heavy. We all know, uh, you know, compost adds. Uh, we talked about this last week uh, on what the different amendments do. Compost is very rich. It's going to help feed you long. It's going to make nutrients readily available. Um, other people like to go. And this one, the clue is in the name. But this is monster. Okay. There's also topsoil. Uh, and people use that for top dressing. So have a look, but you really can't go wrong. Some people use sand, some people use gypsum. Um, there's any different uh, number of options you can do, um, but you want to put good stuff in. And you can do a blend. You can do a blend. You can do uh, peat moss and worm castings. You can do uh, compost and topsoil. Uh, you can do sand and compost. Whatever it is that you have been advised your lawn needs or you think it needs, that is what you can add to your lawn. And we don't want it to be thick. Again, um, if you're fixing a damaged lawn, uh, somebody had to drive machinery across your lawn and you've got those deep ruts from the bobcat tires, um, or your lawn had some frost heaps, it happens, and now you've got dips in your lawn. Yeah, you can fill that, but then you're gonna have to do a full overseeding to get that grass back. For the most part, you know, items are gonna. Very few lawns are, are flat as pancakes. They've all got some ripples to it. Uh, that's nature. We just want to go with quarter inch to a half inch max. And I consider personally a half inch heavy. Quarter is the maximum I would personally go to. Normally for me, it's a really thin skiff. I dust with it. Then I take my rake and, and you can use either one, either or, it doesn't matter. And I dump it all out. And I don't use my rake like this to flip it. And what I do is I blend in. So I get nice and low. And all this does is it breaks up the aggregates, but it allows the, uh, the grass blades to go through the rake. So I'm not raking the soil up. I'm blending it in 
right into the roots where it needs to be. I'm smoothing out any aggregates and I'm making it easier so that when it rains or when we water, it's going to filter down to the roots quicker. Okay, so that is kind of uh, what top dressing is. Why do we top dress? We've already talked about that. It improves the soil. That is the main reason. The, the rest are important as well. Uh, if you're looking at the uh, if you're looking at the PowerPoint, um, but it improves the quality of the soil because a lot of times we take our lawns for granted. Um, we're very careful with our perennials, or we absolutely baby our tomatoes, and we're measuring the fertilizer. We go, oh no, it's Friday. I've got to go fertilize. Um, we're, we're out inspecting for bugs. The lawn, we're like, yeah, it's green, and we walk on it, and that's. A lot of times the consideration our lawns get. Um, but if we want that healthy lawn, we're going to have to do it. So we're going to have to improve the soil. Adding that soil is going to help the thatch break down, uh, much like a compost um, in, in your backyard. If you do backyard composting or if you go into the forest and you see it, you mix soil in with it, it's going to accelerate because of all the nitri uh, 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 nitrogen and all of the microorganisms. It's going to help everything break down. So if you weren't able to get all the thatch, maybe you don't have the energy. Uh, maybe you wanted to leave some for whatever reason. This is going to help it break down. It's going to help smooth and level the lawn. It's going to protect the seeds. We're going to get to that in a second. It's going to help the seeds germinate, and it's going to help your damaged lawns. Um, much like if you have a perennial, a lot of people come up to me uh, and they say, oh, my perennials aren't doing good. Um, I fertilize and I say, when was the last time you amended your soil? And they haven't done it in a while or they don't know. They amend the soil, the perennials come back like that. Much the same. Your lawn is damaged. It needs that uptake of something fresh and it's going to help with that. And like anything, you put down a compost, it's going to help with moisture retention. Okay, so we're clean, we're dethatched, they're not top dressed. Now we're going to start seeding. Most important thing, uh, I think, when it comes to seeding, is knowing your exposure. Uh, we get people who come in uh, and they go, I need to seed my lawn. And I go, no problem. Is it sun or shade? Is it a blend? And they go, I don't know. And I go, okay, let's walk through it. And we, we get to the answer. And uh, it's no problem if you don't know. Uh, absolutely. Now, if this drugs your memory, have a look at it if you're going to need it. But we'll help you get that. We'll, we'll, it, everybody knows the sun exposure on their property. They just might not know the parameters or how to describe it. So we can help you. Any, any good independent garden center is going to have people that will help get you there. Um, but it is important to know because if you put down a sun seed uh, in the shade, it's not going to germinate. So it is important to know that. Consider the usage of the law. Okay? Depending on what seed you go with, um, or if you want to think of a lawn alternative, you might have to consider the usage. If, if you've got a, a couple of kids, you've got a dog, you've got all three, you have a busy life, and I appreciate you. But um, I have a dog, um, and uh, I have a teenager. A uh, teenager now, he doesn't play on the lawn, he goes out with his friends. But when he was a kid, he likes to play on the grass. The dog loves to play on the grass. I walk all over my lawn. Uh, I have a fire pit on my lawn. So my lawn is high traffic. Okay. I'm aware of that. Other people, they just want that pristine look. They want it as a frame to that garden. Uh, and that is totally fine too. So understanding what you're looking for, be aware of the dimensions. And the reason I say that is you're going to do it all the same. It doesn't matter how big or how small it is. It is going to matter on how much seed. So let me just grab this. This is Kentucky Blue. I don't know if this is going to show up, Brandy. Let me know. But on the bottom of the lawn, uh, is that showing up? It's, well? it's tiny, it's but it's tiny. there. Yeah. So on the bottom of the bag, uh, it's going to tell you the coverage it's going to give. So if you know your dimensions, you can come in and be like, oh, I need two bags or oh, one bag has more than got me covered. Um, so you're not having to make extra trips, but you're not wasting money by buying too many and realizing you only need a half of one bag. And only seed when the temperatures are up. Warm seed is like any other seed. It needs moisture. It needs warmth in order to germinate. If it's too cold, if the temperatures aren't great, it's not going to do very well for you. And now, 
Uh, I just wanted to touch because this, uh, a lot of people always ask about this, about what the lawn uh, needs. So let's start with the one most people know, and that's our Kentucky Blue, okay? Uh, fantastic for full sun. Uh, this bag contains nothing but Kentucky Blue. I think it's 99.8%. Some other seats might get in there, but it's Kentucky Blue. Uh, Kentucky Blue is the uh, literal standard of lawn. It's lush, uh, dense green, it gives you that gorgeous carpet. It is a full sun requirement. So if you have a ton of shade uh, or you only get sun for four or five hours, Kentucky Blue might not be the one for you. That runs. Oh my God, I'm going to, Kentucky Blue might not be the one. Anyway, uh, I'm going to write jingles now. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a career change. I'm going into jingle writing. Kentucky Blue can be high maintenance. Uh, it is going to establish well, it is going to uh, get nice and thick, but in order to keep it that way, you're going to have to cut it correctly, you're going to have to water it, you're going to have to fertilize it. It is going to need some love in order to get there. Can you just leave it to the to the elements? Absolutely can, but you're not going to get that look that a lot of people want when they think of Kentucky Blue. So, uh, you have to consider that, and it's a very slow germinator. It's out of the three main grass seeds. It's normally the last one to come up. Uh, now we have creeping red fescue, and that's in this one. Low maintenance, okay? And this is great um, for your shadier areas. Uh, both Kentucky Blue and red fescue can take relatively high traffic. Kentucky Blue is used on a lot of golf courses, a lot of people walking, they got spikes, swacking balls off it. Uh, so it can take relatively high maintenance. Um, the red fescue is also going to form a nice carpet. It doesn't give you that same green of the Kentucky blue, but it is beautiful. Uh, it tends to be lower maintenance. It's kind of going to look the same if you're a little, if you're a little more lax about your fertilizing and your watering, um, it, it can, it can take care of itself relatively easy and it germinates, uh, Faster than, uh, faster than Kentucky Blue, but it, I wouldn't say it was fast. You're looking for fast, you want your perennial ryegrass. And there's literally a reason. Number one ingredient, perennial ryegrass, this is called quick grass. Um, perennial ryegrass, uh, it can be thin. People do do it at fall lawns. doesn't really work in our climate. What it is amazing for is if you need to fill an area quick. So you can put down perennial ryegrass. If you've got a slope, it'll help establish that slope real quick. Then you can overseed with a Kentucky blue or a fescue. You can have a slower grass that's going to come up. So it's really, really good for that. It is very relative uh, in its maintenance. Doesn't need much at all. It's kind of going to take care of itself. And like I said, it is a lightning fast germination. But I don't, especially in Calgary climates, I don't recommend that this one is used along. A lot of times. People will have a dead patch, they'll use this. The grass comes in, looks amazing, they cut it. Next year, they have the same dead patch. Can't live up to our harsh winters here in Calgary. Other places like England, it's going to do fine. So just having that idea, why and how do I seed my lawn? Why? To replenish lawn that's died. Lawn is a living plant. It takes structural damage. It's going to die off. We add it to thicken up the lawn. The lawn looks good. It's nice and thick. It could be a little thicker. So we put down some grass seed on that, uh, or we overseed to meet a changed condition. What I mean is now maybe uh, there's been an extension um, and you've got shade, or somebody cut a tree down, you've now got sun. So you may need to start changing the blend of grass that you've always used. Um, so we, we look at all of those conditions. How do I see? after we rake it's after we deep thatch it's when we do our top dress so there's a lovely organic bed for that seed to sit on so it's not trying to get into a clay soil spread the seed by hand or with a seed spreader we've got broadcast spreaders we've got handheld ones we've even got just little shake jars you can just literally shake them like that uh these little handle you crank and then the broadcast i'm not going to spread it up that's the one that you walk behind that's the one that's in the picture uh cover it to what you need so completely bare there'll be instructions 
use this much seed. If it's just an overseeding to thicken up, there's going to be different instructions. Uh, play to the instructions uh, accordingly. And then I like to use uh, whatever I top dressed with, uh, maybe my lawn soil, my compost, some peat moss, and do a thin skip over it. That's going to protect it. It's going to help keep uh, the birds uh, and the other critters off. How am I doing for time? I'm, oh, wow. Um, okay, we got to go real quick here. People. No, we're fine. I know, that's on me. I think we should be okay. Um, but yeah, I see people dig a long seed and they just throw all the seed down and they walk away and they don't water it uh, and they don't cover it. And the birds are like, thank you so much. And they're in the yard eating because they're looking for food in the spring. So just putting that skip over it uh, helps keep the moisture on it, um, helps protect it from animals. Um, and it's just going to give you the best bet for germination. Fertilizing mold. Fertilizing, and you'll you'll really think down after top dressing because again, even when it comes to my lawns, if I have to pick between a healthy soil and a fertilizer, I'm always going healthy soil. Um, that being said, if we can do both, that is the that is the jack. So. Fertilizing the lawn, it's going to promote active, healthy growth. And I just grabbed a couple of fertilizers here. Just move them to the front. And it's going to make your lawn, uh, just like it does with any plant, it's going to give it the nutrients it needs uh, in order to start growing properly um, and, and coming up. It's frequently overlooked. I know some people, they may fertilize in the spring. Uh, they may not. Again, it's a whole... We take our lawns for granted. Um, and then we wonder why our lawns don't maybe look so awesome. So fertilizing is absolutely important. It helps inhibit weeds. Thick, lush lawn that's being fed properly isn't going to allow as many weeds in as a lawn that's thin and struggling. Correct fertilizer for the season. So this one is spring and summer. This one is a starter, works great in the spring, or great if you've got an area that's all just a new lawn. Oh, come over. Uh, and then we have summer blends, and we have autumn fall blends. Use the right one for the season, um, and it's going to get your lawn to where it needs to be. Again, it is an important facet of having that healthy lawn. Uh, do it after the top dress and after the seeding. Now your seed is down, it's covered, it's a lovely bed, dethatched. Fertilizer goes on top as it's warm and as it's uh, as it moisturizes there, it uh it starts to break down and it's gonna start feeding those roots immediately. Um so it's a good idea uh, to do it last. Follow the recommended amount and you want to fertilize regularly. And uh I recommend uh you tear yourself away from me for a second and look at the point. Uh, because this is a great image of um, how your lawn can look with the proper feeding. And yeah. it's very similar. If you uh, if you Googled um, fertilized tomato plant that has been fertilized versus tomato plant no fertilizer, you're probably going to see one that's green and healthy and laden with fruit versus something spindly, not really the nicest green, and maybe two or three tomatoes on it. So again, getting that fertilizer down really, really helps. Uh, it helps the root development. Um, it allows uh, better growth so it can photosynthesize because this lawn is capturing all available light. It's pulling it all in. So boosting it and giving it that feed uh, is absolutely essential into having that nice thick carpet. So now watering will. Um, Watering the lawn is, uh, a lot of people go, oh, well, it, it rained three days ago. And I always say, well, you had a glass of water three days ago. It might not carry you through. You might need more than that. And the same is true with your lawn. Again, it's a plant. So I'm delinquent on mine. I'll freely admit it. But again, mine is a lawn alternative. Um, if watering the lawn isn't something you want, you might want to look at a clover. You might want to look at something different. But if we're looking at Kentucky blues, not fescues, Watering is going to be essential. It is a plant that can't photosynthesize without that water. It can't grow without that water. It needs it to stay green. And sprinklers 
are your best friends for your walls. So you can even have fun ones. That's why I grabbed this one. Oh my goodness. I know, right? You have to show that closer. That's so cute. What and kids that? love running through it. Yeah, it just literally attaches to your hose. It's on a spike. You put it in and it literally just goes <laughs> and you can move it around. A lot of fun. Or you can just go fully a fish. And you can get something like this. There's bigger ones, there's smaller ones, there's spot ones, there's all like everything with a garden, all the different nozzles you can get for your hoses. There are a ton of different sprinklers. And ideally, low and slow is true. What I mean by is uh, you go out and water your lawn with a nozzle. Absolutely, you can do that. You can sit on your deck. So we did a, uh, a podcast last week was the Sodcast. We had a guest from uh, Scots, uh, Shelly. Shelly is fantastic. Colleague of mine, Shelly and I get along great. She is a lawn care expert. And we were asking Shelly some questions. Brandy, I did an interview with her. Uh, and at the end, Brandy asked a great question. And it said, uh, Brandy's question was, uh, Shelly, what is uh, your, your, what is your, what is your tip uh, for lawn care? And it's the best tip ever. And Shelly said, don't make it a chore enjoy it there's nothing wrong with uh sitting back having a cup of tea or cracking a beer whichever you prefer sitting in your deck chair with your nozzle and just spraying your grass and if you knew shelly like i know shelly i could absolutely picture her doing that and i was like that is great but for the most part we don't have the time to go out water our lawns uh with a nozzle so sprinklers are great and low and slow simply means People go out there with their nozzle full blast and they do that. The lawn can't drink it all. So it's pooling on top and it's evaporating um, or it's going straight through the soil and it's not staying at the roots. Low and slow means you want your sprinkler to just be moving nice and slow. You don't want high pressure where it's spraying everywhere. You just want a nice low and slow vibe going on. You know, maybe put on some Coltrane or something. You got a low, slow vibe. You're grooving with your life. Move with your life. Why not? Plants have been shown to respond well to music. Yeah. Should have included music for your law. We should start a song. Yeah. Oh. Okay, that I know what. It literally now just going to talking about music. We'll get back. Uh, your lawn is best watered early in the morning earlier the better uh by early i mean daybreak so you know we're looking at like five o'clock in the morning i uh, get that lawn water it allows it all to be absorbed without it evaporating anything that it didn't need the heat will slowly evaporate off later in the day you can run it you can encourage slugs onto your lawn or oh, it's evaporating way too fast the lawn isn't getting as much as you think be careful not to overwater uh, and a great trick is the tuna can or the frisbee trick. So we all know a tuna can is about that big, that deep. Frisbee is wider, but it's more shallow. They hold about the same volume of water, give or take, depending on the size. This is a rule of thumb. So put your sprinkler on. You've got your sprinkler here. You put it on, uh, and you put your frisbee here. Once that frisbee is, your frisbee is upside down. Uh, once that frisbee is filled, once that tuna can is filled, that's enough water. Turn off your sprinkler, you're done. Now, if you want, the first time you do that, you can time it. And you can say, oh, it took uh, 23 minutes to fill. I need to water my grass for 23 minutes. You may need to adjust if it's hotter, if it's cooler, something else going on. Maybe you already had some rain. So you might need to adjust that, but it gives you an excellent rule of thumb to start. And it's always a good idea after you've overseeded, after you've fertilized, to water that in. Start that fertilizer breaking down. We already said seeds need moisture uh, and they need warmth in order to germinate. Your lawn seed is no different. Okay. Aeration. I'm going to touch on this one. Uh, every year, uh, people come around and ask people uh, if they want to get their lawns aerated. Aeration can be a good thing. It can also be a bad thing. Like anything, if you're going out, like I said, and you're dethatching your lawn every week, you're going to be damaging your lawn. It wants that thatch. You know, another another good purpose of thatch 
uh, that I should have included, but it just occurred to me now, is it cushions it. So when you step on your lawn and you've got that layer of thatch, it's like it's like an insole in your shoe. If you don't have that, you're stepping directly on the roots. That layer of thatch is a cushion. Okay, so yes, it is good to de thatch, but we also want thatch. Aeration is beneficial if it is done properly. Uh, all an aeration is is you pull out the plugs, and then the best thing to do is get rid of those plugs. A lot of times people say, oh, they'll break back down. Do they? Uh, it might take a long time, and then you're going to get mounds on your lawn. Get rid of them. Get them gone. Then start from scratch. Do a top dress. You want to fill those holes with good organic material. You want to fertilize. You want to seed. You want to water. And what it's going to do is it's going to break up the compaction. Push, it, it punches out a plug. So it puts a hole so the lawn's able to eat where it's compact like that. Now it's got some wiggle room and it can start moving again, which is what you want. So it's going to help with the compaction. We're going to put a healthy organic mix into it. We're going to fertilize. That gas exchange is happening. Now roots are being fed uh, and away you go. So aeration has a benefit. Doing it every year, not putting anything in those holes and leaving those plugs on the surface. I don't think that's a good way to do your lawn, but again, other people swear by it. I'm not here to tell you that what you're doing is right or wrong. I'm just here to give you some advice and some tips on what you can look at. Normally when I do aerations, uh, when I was landscaping, depending on the condition of the lawn, we wouldn't aerate any, any more frequently than three to five times a year, uh, three to five times uh, yearly. So I'm saying that very wrong. Every third or fifth year, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, didn't need to be done every year. And if you're doing an excellent top dress and you're adding good things to help break down that clay, you've got an active growing lawn where the roots are growing and they're moving the soil, and you've got a healthy, natural lawn happening, you might not need to aerate because it's not going to be compact because you've amended your soil. So that is lawn care in a nutshell. I recommend you look at my thank you gift because it's literally my favorite uh, part of the PowerPoint, because it is a long flamingo. Uh, so thank you for tuning in. You know, I have one. Yeah, I do. Oh, I've got flamingo. You got it a couple of years ago for Brad, yeah. didn't you? Best thing ever. Uh, we did go a little over. My apologies, but of course we have time for Q&A.